The present module discusses the dynamics of public enterprise environment, focusing on the various issues of corporate governance, corporate social responsibility, memorandum of understanding, privatization, disinvestment, and mergers and acquisitions during this globalized period. Let us now first talk about the concept of globalization. In the emerging global context, the old models of corporate management, both at public and the private sector, are increasingly becoming obsolete. The present chapter attempts to discuss these new dimensions of public enterprises in India to meet the global competition. These public enterprises influence the economic growth and vis-a-vis -vis are being affected by the overall economic growth in the globe. As against the nominal GDP of 12 to 13 percent at current market price, the gross value addition by all these CPSCs is around 4 to 5 percent every year. Although the first few national plans emphasized on the role of public enterprises in the initial development phase of the country, there has been a change in the perceptions by the end of the last decades. The preparation for unbindling of services through the disinvestment process at the national level started during 1984 and when the first national committee was set up to advise the public enterprises management system. In this background, the government of India has also undertaken the reforms agenda from 1991, which has been also called as the economic liberalization period for our country. In 1991, the central government proposed the new public sector investment in order to limit their coverages to the strategic and high technology oriented enterprises along with the expansion of infrastructure at the countries. Now, let us talk about the four phases through which these reforms have been initiated in our country. The phase one started during the post-independence that is from 1950 to 1969. In this phase, the seeds were laid down to build a modern and a strong industrial base in our country. The public sector was required to occupy the core space through the investment in capital goods, heavy industries and in defense. During this period, the foundations were laid among the government to these sectors in the steel, coal, oil and natural gas, telecom, machinery, heavy industries and other core sectors of manufacturing. The phase two started from 1969 and was being planned till 1984. In this particular phase, the public enterprises were seen as an instrument of the state's growth. The state nationalized companies and the new industries during this regime. During this period, the private enterprises were not taken out but were heavily controlled through licensing, import control and with the new MRTP Act. The phase of three, that is the third phase, was started in 1994 with new economic policies initiated by the government of India. During this period, the economic reforms were initiated in our country. The reforms primarily focused to improve the efficiencies, to globalize the public sector enterprises and to reduce the physical imbalances. The post-reform progressively improved the public sector's performance whereby reducing the burdens on the government's exchequer through their own contributions and generation of their profits. The fourth phase started during 2004 with the new UPA government coming into force again in the elections. During this period, these enterprises were where the loss making was very huge was instructed to close down or to adapt the restructuring mechanism. The CPSCs were encouraged to go for listing on the stock exchanges and also to establish their presence in the international domains. 
and also they have been given the enhanced autonomy through the diversified board performance and adapting the new trends through the corporate governance norms and practices. Now let us talk about the new industrial policy which was initiated in 1991. The new industrial policy 1991 has been a very very great landmark in the reform stage for the public enterprises in India. During this period it has given the important tools for the ease enterprises to restructure, to liberalize, privatize and to be global as all the enterprises started working towards this direction. During the 10 years regime of the UPA government, the government also earmarked many reforms and restructuring programs to support the public sector enterprises and to restructure and to perform. Towards this directions, they also have enacted many policies and programs. Let us talk about the UPA policy towards the reforming of public enterprises which was initiated in May 2004. The UPA government led by Dr. Manmohan Singh took a U-turn regarding the privatization policy pursued by the earlier government regimes and declared that no profit-making PE will be divested. The government pledged to develop a full managerial control and commercially viable enterprises to be more autonomy and to have a successful performance along with the profit-making companies operating in the competitive environment. It also agreed to start the Navaratna companies, that is the nine jewels, which could raise resources from the capital markets. The policy statement also mentioned that chronically loss-making PEs will either be sold off or closed. But not much progress has been undertaken during this period of the UPA policy. In February 2005, the government formally announced a call off for the disinvestment through strategic sale which was announced by the earlier governments which includes Hindustan Petroleum Corporation, Engineers India Limited, State Trading Corporation, Rastriya Chemicals and Fertilizers, National Aluminium Corporation and Shipping Corporation of India. On 25th November 2005, the government decided in principle to list large profit making public enterprises on the domestic stock exchanges and to selectively sell small portions of their equity through listing. And at present, there are around 47 public enterprises which are listed in Bombay Stock Exchange. On November 5th, 2009, the government again announced its reform plans for the public enterprises through the various disinvestment programs. As a part of its equity in profit making, the government enterprises includes all these important phenomena. Already listed profit PEs meeting the mandatory requirements of disinvesting at least 10% as prescribed by SEBI and are to be made compliant by the offer of sale by the government out of holdings or by the public enterprises through the issue of fresh shares and combination of both. Unlisted PEs with no accumulated losses and having earned net profit in their preceding consecutive years would be listed on the stock exchange. Follow-up offers of the public offerings would be done for those enterprises where the listing has already been done and the enterprises being more profitable. In all the cases of disinvestment, the government would retain at least 1% equity and the management control. The National Common Minimum Program which emphasized on the full managerial and control of autonomy to successful profit-making enterprises to operate in competitive environment. The government reviewed the powers of delegation of authority of the boards of these Navaratna enterprises and Miniratna enterprises along with the profit-making CPSCs to see that there is an enhanced delegation of power 
during August 2005. The government also introduced the concept of Maharatna scheme in February 2010 with an objective to delegate the enhanced powers to the boards of identifying large sized Navratna enterprises so as to facilitate expansion of their operations both in the domestic as well as global markets. The government has granted enhanced powers to the boards of Maharatna enterprises and other Navratna and profit making enterprises. The CPSCs that are eligible for Maharatna status include that CPSCs pose a Navratna status earlier with a minimum prescribed shareholdings under the SEBI regulation with an annual turnover of 25,000 crores and with a net worth of 15,000 crores and 5,000 crores of profit for the past three years consecutively. The government has conferred upon the Maharatna status initially to five public sector enterprises which includes the Indian Oil Corporation, the NTPC Limited, the Oil and Natural Gas Corporation of India, a Steel Authority of India and the Coal India Limited in April 2011. These Maharatna CPSCs in addition of having the status of Navratna powers have also been delegated with additional powers in the area of investment in joint ventures, subsidiaries and human resource development. The Maharatna CPSCs can invest around 5000 crores in a project which has been approved by the respective board of directors of the companies. Presently, there are 16 Navratna companies and the public sector during the economic liberalization phase has a special features which have been included to get on to this status. These includes the autonomy of PEs to be classified under these four important segments that is Maharatna, Navratna, Miniratna 1 and 2 and profit making enterprises. Now let us talk about the various issues that the PEs are dealing with in terms of the corporate governance practices which are one of the important statuses that have been given to these enterprises. The importance of corporate governance principles in ensuring transparency and enhancing the trust to the shareholders, the government approved the guidelines on corporate governance for all the CPSCs for the first time in 2007. These principles include composition of board, number of functional directors, roles and responsibilities of independent directors, etc. The corporate governance is all about the performance of the board of directors representing the right of shareholders as a true owner and by the corporation to their own role as trustees and behavior of the shareholders as a whole. The board's primary duty is to protect the interest of all shareholders while conducting the affairs of the company in an ethical and a transparent manner. Now let us talk about the issues of corporate social responsibility which have been gaining lot of emphasis in the current scenario. Corporate social responsibility is an entry point for understanding the societal needs and issues and responding to them by the firm which has been in the business in the respective areas and integrating the business strategies along with the societal goals. However, it may be noted that there is a universal and prominent view on the aspects of CSR, which are also being talked upon the shareholders interest. Emerging economies like India has also witnessed a number of firms actively engaged in the CSR issues and the Ministry of Corporate Affairs have come up with the voluntary guidelines for the first time and then initiated these reforms in the country. The Department of Public Enterprises has also issued the guidelines both in CSR as well as on the corporate governance standards which CPSCs are mandated to follow. It is mandated 
for the profit making central public sector enterprises in India to have a CSR budget and also take the approval for the activities that will be undertaken under the CSR regime of these enterprises. The latest companies bill that is 2012 which has come out as the Companies Act in 2013 also reflects on the various issues of corporate social responsibility and also the corporate governance strategies. Now let us talk about an important issue which has been one of the prime focused area for the public sector enterprises when we talk about measuring their performance. It is the memorandum of understanding. The MOU was partnered as one of the important French model in India during 1984 and this has come as an evaluation methodology to evaluate the performance of the public enterprises. The goals, objectives, missions, targets of these CPSCs have been linked with the performance of the enterprises by entering a contract which is called an MOU. During 91-92, as a part of the economic liberalization, the government has introduced this system of MOUs in the public enterprises. The introduction of this MOU system has given a rare opportunity both for the government as well as the public enterprise to negotiate certain important measures which could be termed as and measured as their own performance at a later stage. Most of the MOU signing enterprises has shown a greater deal of appreciation for the MOU system which distinguishes the managerial performance of the enterprise with that of the enterprise performance as a whole. The principle which acts with these enterprises the MOU system also presents an objective solution to the problems conflicting interest of principal with the agent. The Arjun Sain Gupta committee report which has brought this concept of MOU system into the public enterprise system during 1984 witnessed so many changes with the new mechanisms that have been adapted with the research studies that have come out with the expert committees from the National Council of Applied Economic Research. The revised system reveals more on dynamic indicators as compared to the static indicators that form the base for the first generation of these MOUs. Let's talk about the reforms and restructuring practices that these enterprises have started adapting as a policy matter which has come with the new economic regime. The central public enterprises operating under various dynamic market conditions, it's quite natural to see up and downs in their own performances. Some enterprises have, however, incurred huge losses. They are also basically because these are also called as inceptional losses. And they also have the accumulated losses which have been accumulated over so many years. Under the provision of the Sikh Industrial Companies Act 1985, the CPSCs have been referred to the Board for Restructuring of Financial Restructuring and under the provision of the Sikh Industrial Companies Act of 1985, the CPSCs have to be referred to Board for Industrial and Financial Reconstruction on becoming Sikh or insolvent. The table depicts that the status and also the loss making enterprises which are available along with the accumulated losses from the period 2004 to 2012. The government constituted the board for reconstruction of public enterprises in 2004 as an advisory board to review and restructure sick and loss making CPSCs. Since then there has been a significant improvement in overall condition of these enterprises. In comparison to 96 CPSCs in March 2005, there has been a reduction in the number to 66 SIC enterprises in 2012. The table shows that the current status of enterprises which were registered with BRPSC has also constantly been coming down. It is seen that in 2000. 
12, there are no enterprises which have been registered as SIC. Now let us understand the concept of market capitalization which has been one of the important parameter during the post-liberalization for these enterprises. Much before the onset of the economic liberalization, Sri R. Venkatraman, the then finance minister, government of India, pleaded for the public enterprises to interface with the capital market. The Krishna Menon Committee report on the autonomy of public enterprises, which was out in 1959, made a strong case in favor of the autonomous status of public enterprises. The economic liberalization promoted these interfaces very, very intensively and as a result, large number of public enterprises and banks have approached the capital market to raise funds. More than 50% of the market capitalization belongs to the public enterprises, which has also added so much liquidity and credibility to the capital market system. The ONGC led 33 Indian companies on the Forbes list in 2000 and also the market capitalization during 2013 amounted to around 11 lakh crore. The market capitalization of wealth engines included the Oil and Natural Gas Limited, NTPC, Indian Oil Corporation, Bharat Heavy Electricals Limited, Bank, State Bank of India Limited, Steel Authority of India, Gale, Nalco, Punjab National Bank and Bharat Petroleum Corporation. Currently, there are around 47 CPSCs which have been on the stock exchange over a period of time. From this particular table, we are trying to show the top five companies which are there in the public sector regime which has attained the highest market capitalization. After market capitalization, let us understand the concept of internalization of these CPSCs. Internationalization of the public sector enterprises increasingly into the international trade of goods and services which has a bearing on the balance of payment of the country. During the year 2011 and 12, as many as 147 CPSCs out of 225 operating either had a foreign investment or has been in the foreign exchange expenditure. Internationalization of uh, the central public enterprises increasingly into the international trade of goods and services which has a bearing on the balance of payments of the country. During the year 2011 and 12, as many as 147 CPSCs out of 225 operating enterprises had a foreign exchange or have been earning foreign expenditure. As many as 34 CPSCs were having a net foreign exchange earning during the regime. Out of these 34 CPSCs, the net foreign exchange is more than 100 crores in the top 10 CPSCs. These enterprises include BHEL, Air India, Narco, Airports Authority of India, Air India Charters, Ircon International, Rights, KIOCL, Indian Rare Earths, and Cochin Shipyard. The exports of goods and merchandise and other income are being for the major sources for these foreign exchange earnings by these enterprises. Export of merchandise was a major source of foreign exchange earning in this period. The central public enterprises have set up subsidiaries abroad for marketing their own products and for procuring raw materials and also consolidation of their international operations. ONGC Videsh is a classic example which has been successfully acquiring oil and other gas assets abroad. During the year 2012, the ONGC Videsh Limited has participated directly and wholly owned many subsidiaries of J through JVs and this number includes around 30 in different countries. 
let us talk about the concept of prioritization and disinvestment when these are being very important focused areas of the industrial policy for the government of india one of the major element of the public enterprise policy in the economic liberalization era relates to the disinvestment and privatization through strategic sale of the equity among these enterprises the policy has lacked consistency continuity and well thought of the various reasons the table shows a quantum of actual disinvestment process on the public enterprises along with the methodological adapted during this period of economic liberalization the targets and the budgetary receipts of these investments are discussed in the table there has been a trench criticism on the disinvestment moves during the periods of 1991 92 1990 and 2004 although many administrative involvements were done to make the disinvestment more logical transparent and deliver the best of the program still it could not achieve its targets the two of the oft-repeated questions against the disinvestment process in our country has been to what was the motivation of the government in neglecting the restructuring exercise prior to taking the efforts of closing down or becoming globally competent to meet the challenges the public enterprises in the capital markets have been variously two of the oft raised questions against the disinvestment in india has been as to what was the motivation of the government in neglecting the restructuring exercise prior to such an effort which is a globally accepted practice and the base of ipo process as a method of share sale despite having high ranking of these enterprises in the capital market in india as assessed by the various credit rating agencies the table below shows about the actual disinvestment process the transactions the budget receipts and the total receipt after the disinvestment is done the reconstruction of public enterprises and social safety net program was one of the important initiative of the pe policy in india the washington conciseness of 1983 also reflected in the economic liberalization program of 1992 based on the sole premise that the well-being of people could be increased by disposing the public assets owned by these enterprises the global experience of disinvestment has reeled on the restructuring of public enterprises prior to their sale as also their reconstruction of their and of their assets and rehabilitation the common minimum program of the upa government makes a mention of the rehabilitation of the public enterprises through the board of reconstruction of public enterprises 20 such cases which have been referred to brpsc of which it has considered 17 for the process of giving its mind of remaining the closures The BRPSC is implementing the plan for the rehabilitation of seven CPSCs, including Bridge and Roof Corporation, Hindustan Salts, BBJ Constructions Limited, Praga Tools, HMT Bearings, Heavy Engineering Corporation, Breathweight Corporations. It is interesting to mention that as a part of reconstruction exercise and to fight fit. for the successful existence in the global market the merger of air india and indian airlines is a very classic case the india post is an excellent example of undergoing the restructuring and coming back with a big bang to take a private sector couriers into challenge this includes not only private sector but also the mncs which are into the courier business like dhl and fedex the indian airlines are not lagging behind and giving a tough fight to the private airlines many pes are going for diversifying their activities through the reforms of 
and restructuring programs in terms of manpower restructuring, operational restructuring strategies, strategic management initiatives, financial initiatives, and operational restructuring scenarios. Those enterprises which have come back after the restructuring phase includes Hindustan Machine Tools Limited, State Bank of India, Hindustan Shipyard, Rastri Ispat Nigam Limited, which have been quoted every time. Use of the funds for disinvestment has been one of the major programs of the Common Minimum Program which have been initiated by the UPA government. The revenues that are generated from the disinvestment were to be utilized in the areas of health, education, particularly in the poorer and the backward areas of the country. A part of the fund was to be earmarked to create an investment fund which was to be used to strengthen the public enterprise system also. The Disinvestment Commission recommended in February 1997 that the proceeds of the disinvestment has to be placed separately into a disinvestment fund and this fund temporarily meeting the losses of CPSCs before disinvestment and they should also help in to control the required phases through the restructuring programs to strengthening the managerial loss making enterprises preparing these enterprises for disinvestment providing benefits to the workforce found of the surplus being distributed among these people the january 2005 the government created a national investment fund and transferred all the realizations from the sale of minority shareholdings through disinvestment into the fund. The corpus of that fund was to be a permanent nature and it was managed professionally by the public enterprise mutual fund companies. Around 75% annual income of the fund was to be used in the financing the schemes which prominently includes the education, health and employment and also to meet the balance it threw the capital investment among these profit-making enterprises. However, in 2009, the government decided to give a one-time exemption to utilize in full the proceeds from the disinvestment from April 2009 to 2012 March for funding capital expenditure of its pet schemes, namely the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme the Indira Avas Yojana, Rajiv Gandhi Gramin Vidyut Yojana, Jawaharlal Nehru Arpan Renewal Mission, Accelerated Integration of the Irrigation Benefit Program and also Power Development Programs. The restructuring and reforms through mergers and acquisition has also gained a lot of popularity during this period. Mergers and acquisitions are the most popular forms of corporate restructuring and has become an integral part of the long-term business strategies of the corporate enterprises. Merger refers to a situation when two or more existing firms combine together and form a new entity. Merger occurs in two forms. They are through the absorption and also through consolidation. Acquisition refers to acquiring of ownership right in the property and the asset without any combination of the companies. Thus, in companies, the acquisition two or more companies may remain independent and separate legal entity is created. Acquisition results when one company purchase controlling the interest of the share capital of the other company. Both the mergers and acquisition activities involve a substantial number of reforms and deals and the main reasons for moving a number of takeovers, mergers and joint venture is desired to complete and survive in order to meet the global standards. Let us see what are the various reasons why these M&As occur. One of the important reasons is large consumers and industrial markets are developing in several parts of the world. 
Trade barriers have been removed in some areas, especially in the European Union, making assessing to the various market requirements in the globe. Many product markets have become international through the involvement of world communications, trade and other best practices. Privatization in Eastern Europe and more recently in the Latin America has created new investment opportunities. Disparity in valuation of similar companies in different countries can also create a better opportunity for a merger or a takeover. An acquirer may be a company or a person acting in concern that acts together for the purpose of substantial acquisition of shares or voting rights or gaining control over the target company. Generally speaking, takeover means acquisitions and takeovers occur when the acquiring firm takes over the control of the target firm. Acquisition and takeover does not necessarily a title, the full legal control. A company can have control over another company by holding minority ownership. Types of acquisitions. There are four types of acquisitions, namely friendly acquisitions, where both the companies approve the acquisitions under friendly terms. Reverse acquisition, a private company takes over a public company. A backflip acquisition, where very rarely happens when the acquisition process, the purchasing company becomes a subsidiary company of the purchased company. Hostile acquisition, here the name suggests that the entire process is done by the unforeseen element. The smaller company is either driven to such a condition that it has no option but to say yes to the acquisition or to save the skin, the bigger company can buy the complete shares of the smaller company. What are the advantages that we are talking about when you talk these acquisitions or merger scenarios in these enterprises? A number of reasons provide sanctions of the corporate merger and acquisitions and all the necessary financial implications of both these companies are being controlled. Moreover, mergers and acquisition is within the scope of the board of directors to pursue and the company executives to initiate and execute. Since the board members may also be subject to political, social and personal interests, the decision seems to be favorable, not against the shareholders, which is one of the greatest disadvantages of these acquisition process. According to the Investopedia, an estimation of 66% of mergers and acquisitions are not successful because of the m and intent. Of 33% that are considerable successful, the mergers and acquisitions achieved a net gain from the m and with or without bad m and intent. A number of reasons for the minor majority of failures exist in addition to the failures themselves indicating a potential disadvantage of these mergers and acquisition activities and rightly be a high risk activity. Now let us conclude. To sum up, the public enterprises would do the right downsizing as well as the increasing in terms to meet the market capitalization and also to meet the global requirements through these various process initiatives through corporate governance, CSR, MOU, increasing market capitalization, internationalization of their enterprises and also involve themselves into the issues of mergers and acquisition. To meet the global competitiveness, the enterprises are being quite global in nature. Thank you.